dear friends, dear clickers, uh, uh, welcome to the lecture by Professor Pascal Engel. Uh, uh, as convention, uh, let me first to do a short oral introduction to Professor uh, Pascal Engel. This is Professor Pascal Unger. Uh, Professor Pascal Unger uh, is director of, I don't know how to pronounce the UPG, uh, French name, uh, something like that. Uh, at one side, institute, institute of social uh, science, drugs, uh, and a member of center of research, uh, car, car, uh, he has taught in the University of Paris, uh, and chair, uh, I don't, I can't pronounce, uh, Grenoble. Gr then Paris for so and at the University of Geneva. He has held many positions in a number of universities, among which Montreal, Hong Kong, Tunis, Athens, uh, Aarhus, Capella, Oslo, Lowen, Land, Pekin, uh, University, Taiwan, St. Louis, special professor in Nottingham. He had been editor in chief of the A and HCI Journal, uh, Dialectica, from uh, 2005 to 2011. His education, he studied at, uh, I can't pronounce French name, uh, that, and also using Berkeley. Uh, he received two PhDs separately from University of Paris, one, uh, like he, what, uh, and from University of Alex and Provence, Latin Latin. Mm. His affairs uh, of scholarship, epistemology, theory of knowledge, Belief, relativity, truth, philosophy of mind and, and psychology, philosophy of logic, philosophy of, of language, history of analytical philosophy, especially Craig, Russell, Robinson, Davidson, history of contemporary uh, French philosophy. They get a lot of orders and awards. Uh, uh, the French, I can't relax. Uh, the, the most important, yes, uh, he was elected uh, as titular member uh, International uh, Institute of international philosophy, uh, IIP. Uh, right now, he is the uh, secretary general of IIP. Uh, in 2012, he was elected as a member of the Academy Europea. Mm. He was last year, last year, I was elected as uh, International Academy of 
philosophy of science, AIPS, uh, so is quite important academic figure. Mm -hmm. Among his books, uh, the norm of truth. Uh, I hope to see. I read the, the most part of this book. Uh, was uh, deeply impressive. I still remember the 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 the, the in the introduction. He clear up the source of the world uh, philosophical logic. Uh, I said uh, his exposition in my article. And I also uh, uh, remember his strongly against a uh, fragrance uh, of the third, uh, the third realm about swords. He said that the, the uh, fragrance strong realism is worse than psychology. He against. I agree. I agree. Yes. Uh, I, 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 I was sort of maybe I, uh, some, someone should do the translation. Uh, translate this book uh, into Chinese. It is a valuable book. Uh, I think uh, some uh, French. I can't pronounce. Choose. I have this book. Uh, I buy I bought this book, uh, Rock Say Truth and Success. Mm. Yes, uh, a lot of uh, uh, English book, uh, about Frog's book. Uh. Yes, this is English book, uh, The Long of Truth, uh, Truth, Belief, uh, Frog Roxy. Uh, and the philosophy of psycholo psychology. What is the use of truth? Edit. Uh, new inquiry into meaning and truth. Uh, I had also published almost 300 articles in journals and classes. Yes. Uh, tonight, uh, Professor David Basil uh, uh, is the interlocutor of uh, Professor Pascal Anger. Uh, uh, David Basil is the Zhejiang University 100 young professor in the Department of Philosophy. Before that, he has been a postdoc. Doctoral Research Fellow at the University of uh, Geneva and a visiting fellow at the Philosophy of Departments of the University of South Southampton and Kent College, London. His main interests are in epistemology, ethics, and the philosophy of mind. In particular, he is interested in the nature of belief and its relation with truth uh, and the relations between uh, knowledge and practical rationality. So you can see uh, the interest, his interest overlapped uh, uh, with that of Professor uh, Pascal Anger. He published more than 30 equity papers in the very good journals of philosophy. Now, the time is for Professor Pascal Anger's lecture. Please and welcome. Okay, I close. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this presentation. I am very happy uh, to be in your presence and 
to be in the presence of uh, my former student, David Facio, and also of Jie Gao, who uh, uh, is also an important uh, writer on the issues about belief, truth, and practical versus uh, epistemic reason. So it is for me a very good occasion to discuss these issues with them, especially because uh, I didn't have this occasion uh, in Europe uh, during the, the recent years. So I have to go all over to China to meet my uh, young friends. So I, I'm very happy of that. And uh, uh, when the, 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 the covered uh, crisis is really over, I can invite you to visit Wuhan University, no problem. Uh, yes, uh, yes, well, it, it, it's fortunate that we have this technical instrument uh, to see each other because uh, in the old days I had to go to China uh, to speak to my Chinese colleagues but I regret that time I mean when I was teaching in Beijing uh, it was a very good moment and I regret uh, I, I cannot come again but we, we, we have this possibility and I thank you very much especially because uh, Professor uh, you, you, you are, you are a, a member of the International Institute of Philosophy, and I'm very happy that you are a member too. So uh, this is an academic encounter also. So before I start, let me share my, my screen. Um, I need to see how to do that. Um, Okay, I hope. Do you see my Yes, my yes, card? I can. I, I can see right? your PPT, okay. PowerPoint. Okay, good. Good. You have to play. Okay, so I will start. So my paper is about uh, doxastic neopragmatism, and I'm going to explain what it is. There is a lot... Uh, of discussion of these issues in contemporary analytic philosophy and also in non-analytic philosophy. And uh, I, I try in this paper to give my, my view about some recent trends uh, which call themselves and sometimes do not call themselves pragmatists. So I'm going to explain what it is. Um, so I first want to uh, give you a few words of introduction to explain my, my strategy. Then I will discuss uh, the relationship between a view very classical, which is called evidentialism, and also with the pragmatist view. Try to map the terrain. And then I will discuss uh, the notorious issues about uh, right and wrong reasons, which are uh, it is a distinction which is denied by some of the pragmatists. I will then discuss the main idea which is developed by the pragmatists that we can, in some sense, compare uh, the pragmatic reasons and the epistemic reasons for a belief. Uh, my main uh, objection will be that we cannot, and uh, I will ask also whether the pragmatism, I mean, I will give a sort of dilemma for the pragmatism. Either it is very weak, and then uh, it is not pr pr pragmatism at all, or uh, it is very strong, but uh, it is not tenable. So let me start. Um, there is a, in the tradition, in, in the philosophical tradition, uh, there is a view which is called pragmatism about belief. This is the idea that belief is a disposition to act. That is, uh, what it is to believe is to be disposed to certain kind of actions. And this was a view which was defended by the historical pragmatists, that is, Charles Sanders Peirce, William James, and also by uh, the English pragmatists like Frank Ramsey. And the idea is that uh, there is a disposition to act, which is belief. But actually, this is a bit more complex, but it can be summarized 
in a kind of uh, in 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 the, in the following uh, quotation from Robert Stolnaker in his book called Inquiry, uh, and uh, Stolnaker says uh, g- gives what uh, gives what he calls a pragmatic picture about belief. He says rational creatures are essentially agents. Representational mental states should be understood primarily in terms of the role that they play in the characterization and explanation of action. What is essential to rational action is that the agent be confronted or conceive of himself as confronted with a range of alternative possible outcomes of some alternative possible actions. The agent has attitudes, pro and con, towards the different possible outcomes and beliefs about the contribution which the alternative actions would make to determining the outcome. One explains why an agent tends to act in the way he does in terms of such beliefs and attitudes. And according to this picture, our conception of belief and of attitudes, pro and cons, are conception of states which explain why a rational agent does what he does. So this is the main view of uh, the, 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 prima- the, the, the pragmatists, uh, the traditional pragmatists. It is accepted by uh, William James, uh, Charles Sanders Peirce, and this view is different from a view which is sometimes called the will to believe doctrine. James says that we have a will to believe. He says that if in certain circumstances, if we wish to believe something, then we can, provided that the circumstances are good enough, we can make ourselves uh, believe this in different ways. So this view is sometimes called a doxastic voluntarism. But the pragmatists that I am discussing here today, they do not have to subscribe to this strong picture uh, of uh, will to believe. They don't, they need not be committed to this view, at least uh, officially. Officially, they don't need to be, to be committed. But uh, what uh, uh, a number of recent writers have argued is a a view which uh, seems in a way to be, uh, to be less radical than the will to believe doctrine, but which is nevertheless rather radical. Uh, What they want to argue is that uh, belief is governed by prudential and practical reason, not as a matter of fact, but as a matter of its nature or de jure, not simply as an empirical fact, but also it has to be. But according to them, belief is governed by prudential and practical reasons as well as evidence-based epistemic reasons. And according to this view, the prudential or practical reasons which lead us to form and to evaluate beliefs are of the same weight or can be of the same weight as the epistemic reasons. And most of the time, the Practical reasons are uh, very much prevailing. They override uh, the epistemic reason. So this means for the neo-pragmatists that there is no exclusivity or there is no priority of epistemic reasons to believe of a practical reason. I'm going to give example of what it is to be the practical reason for, to believe and what it is to be an epistemic reason to believe in a, in, in a moment. It is a bit abstract, but the, 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 this is the, the thesis in a, in a nutshell. Uh, and if this is the case, uh, well, just let's, let me just give an example. For instance, uh, suppose that uh, you believe yourself uh, to be very intelligent, a very intelligent philosopher. Uh, but also, this is your, your practical reason, you want to believe this, because uh, this is particularly good for a philosopher to believe that he is a good philosopher, otherwise uh, he would not do philosophy, you would be desperate. 
uh, if he says it, that he is a, a bad philosopher. So it is something which is desirable to, to, to have a good opinion of oneself. But on the other hand, everyone knows that even when you have a good opinion of yourself, uh, it doesn't mean that actually this good opinion is epistemically justified. So if sometimes, for instance, you realize that you give bad papers, for instance, and in, in such cases, how can you des desire to be a, a good philosopher if you have evidence that you are not? This is just an example, and there are many others that I'm going to touch upon in this talk. So, uh, according to this view, uh, it, there is no distinction between having practical and having epistemic reasons when it comes to uh, having the beliefs. When you have to, 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 to believe something, you have reasons to believe. And the bad reasons are often called the pragmatic one. I mean, for instance, if you want to believe that you are a, a good philosopher, and if you just believe it because it pleases you, or because you find that it would be a good thing to be a good philosopher, you cannot just believe that uh, as a matter of fact. I mean, you have actually to, to push yourself into uh, the believing. And that's, of course, no good. Uh, or suppose, for instance, that you have a certain illness uh, and you want not to have that illness, you cannot just believe that you don't have it. You have to take into account the evidence. So there are right and wrong kinds of reasons. And according to the neo-pragmatist, there is no really, no, no, no privilege of the epistemic reasons over the pragmatic and prudential reasons. And the practical re and, and in some of the forms of the pragmatism that I'm discussing here today, the practical reason must always dominate the epistemic reasons for, for believing. In other words, according to them, there is always a privilege or an advantage or a domination of the practical reasons over uh, the epistemic reasons. So this is a view which I want to discuss and to object to, to attack. But nevertheless, what well, has to say that I thought a long time ago that this view was, was, was so absurd that nobody would defend it. But uh, it turns out that in the recent years, there have been a lot of defenders of such views, and it has become rather uh, influential and important uh, among some, some writers. So who are these, these writers? Because uh, as a philosopher once told me, uh, when I was giving a talk, he asked me, but who are the bad guys? So the bad guys are these. You have uh, Gilbert Harman, who defended such a view in many ways in, in his book, Changing View. Richard Foley, who I'm going to mention in a, in a book called Working Without the Net. Andrew Reisner, uh, uh, Dina, um, Susanna Rinald, uh, Stephanie Leary, Miriam McCormick, uh, and uh, two authors, uh, I think it's uh, William Maguire and John Woods, uh, Mark Schroeder, and um, uh, Zimmerman, I don't remember his first name, um, and uh, he wrote a book which is called Belief, a Pragmatic Picture, where he actually defends uh, such views. Now, so let me first try to explain what are the basic commitments of these neo-pragmatists that I mean uh, to attack. Most of them accept uh, the background which I have just de defended, which I have just explained. They, um, they accept the pragmatic picture. Uh, that, that, I, that, 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 the, the, that I gave with a quote by, by Robert uh, Stolnaker. They accept that uh, beliefs are not simply disposition to act in some sort of behavioric or behavioral sense. That is, belief is not just a disposition to action because there are also not only uh, desires to believe, but also mental states which uh, uh, orientate our beliefs. 
And in particular, they accept the idea that there are reasons for belief. Uh, so it's, this is fairly different from a kind of simple uh, behaviorism. And they also accept that these kind of reasons uh, are of two sorts. One are the epistemic reasons, and the other are uh, the practical reason. So uh, they accept basically uh, the framework which I've just uh, described. Uh, they also have uh, a view about uh, the idea whether belief have a certain norm. This is a topic which has been discussed pretty much in the recent years. They accept this idea that uh, belief is subject to certain kind of norms. They also make a difference between these norms and norms of rationality. And uh, so uh, their comments seem to be quite all right in terms of the recent discussions. So um, they, 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 as I just said, they focus specifically on the distinction between epistemic uh, and practical and practical reason. To give just another example from different or but very similar from the one which has, I've just given, uh, imagine, for instance, the, the following situation, which is uh, very often developed in, in the literature. Uh, for instance, uh, if a millionaire offers you uh, 500,000 euros uh, to believe that Donald Trump is an honest man, uh, the reward is so strong uh, that I have a practical reason to believe, uh, the, to, to believe this, even if I have no epistemic reason to believe this, uh, or if, even if I cannot convince myself uh, of uh, the honesty of uh, Donald Trump. So, an epistemic reason is typically constituted by the evidence in favor of the belief, while a practical reason is typically constituted by an advantage. Here, the advantage is a reward, an important sum uh, of money. If people give you a lot of money to believe something, then uh, you uh, should, in this sense, it would be very good for you to, uh, to realize the belief. And the literature is replete with such example. Of course, the example is a bit of a caricature because everything is often more, more complex, but uh, the examples uh, are different, uh, but they come up to the same. I mean, uh, this can be financial gain, this can be health, uh, this can be happiness, for instance, uh, if uh, someone tells you that putting on uh, pink glasses, you will become happy. Uh, and if you actually believe this person, then you put on your pink glasses and the world is going to seem to you uh, very bright and pinky. So these are the canonical examples. But the neo-pragmatists reject basically a view which is called uh, in the literature evidentialism. So what is evidentialism? To define it, uh, this is the view that there are epistemic reasons for believing which are exclusive, which have an exclusivity of a practical reasons for believing. This is a common view. I mean, if you believe that, uh, that Trump is not an honest man, and if someone pays you very uh, huge amount of money for not believing that, uh, the epistemic reason that you have for believing that Trump is not an honest man uh, are stronger and have a priority and they even have an exclusivity for believing. I mean, you should disregard uh, on evidentialism the practical reasons that we have. And also, uh, the evidentialist says that the only good reasons to believe are epistemic reasons. Uh, and I will say the right reasons. Now, this view, evidentialism, uh, does not entail that there are no practical reasons to believe. Of course, if you believe that Trump is not an honest man, 
you can also happen to have reasons uh, not to believe that. If you receive a lot of money, or if you, or if, if it is politically uh, useful for you not to believe that, so they do not. Um, they, the the, the evidentialist is not uh, obliged to defend the stronger version. The stronger evidentialist view is the idea that there are only epistemic reasons to believe and practical reasons to believe are not reasons to believe at all, but reasons to want to believe. Just to, to take up my, my same example, I might want, because a, a millionaire gives me $500,000 to believe that, I might want to believe that Trump is an honest man. But uh, the problem is, uh, how can I make myself uh, believe that? But on the strong evidentialist view, this is not simply a, a, a question of empirically getting to that belief. It's a question of whether I have good reasons or not. So uh, this is the evidentialist view that the pragmatists oppose. Uh, and when the pragmatists oppose these views, they can defend two kinds of views, one weak, one robust. Weak pragmatism says that there are epistemic reasons to believe. First, this is something which nobody denies. There may be practical reasons to believe, which are at least as good and sometimes better than epistemic reason. So on the epistemic pragmatist view, on the, on the weak uh, pragmatist view, either you have equal reasons to believe uh, something for an epistemic reason and for a practical reason, and sometimes the practical reasons can override uh, the epistemic reason. And this is a, a weak thesis, I say, because it's doesn't go as far as the following robust pragmatist thesis. The robust pragmatist thesis says that there are no distinctive epistemic reasons to believe. All reasons to believe are practical reasons, including epistemic reasons. And as people say uh, in Australia, this is very strong beer. Uh, according to this view, basically and at bottom, all reasons to believe are practical reasons. Even when you have evidence, and even when you have epistemic reasons, you are sort of governed by the practical reason. So actually, what I said uh, just a few minutes ago is that the, 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 the classical pragmatists, that is the philosophers like William James uh, or uh, Charles Sanders Spurs, uh, and even John Dewey, they never defended the very robust form of pragmatism, or maybe in some of their moments, but this, uh, they, they defend more often the weak pragmatist view. But as we shall see, the neo-pragmatists go as far uh, as uh, defending robust uh, pragmatism. And, of course, these debates are, have been going on for many years, and there is now a wide, a wide literature. Uh, and the kind of example uh, on which uh, the, the neo-pragmatists rely are very close to situations such as Pascal's wager, which I'm not going to discuss at all, but which is important. And they give examples of the following sort. Two examples, uh, the same, same sort of setup uh, as before. Example A, my doctor informs me that I have an incurable disease. This is a very strong epistemic reason to believe that I have few, if any, chances of recovery. But suppose that if I believe that I am going to recover, for instance, if I'm very optimistic, maybe my chances of recovery will become greater. Do I believe that I'm going to recover or not? This is called uh, positive thinking in many circles. It is, you know, it was invented by a French doctor who said, if you wake up every morning, uh, even when the situation is bad, and you say to yourself, oh, today is going to be a bright day, 
today everything will be fine. Sometimes it turns out that you believe, uh, you will believe it. First, that's the first example. The second example is more tricky. Uh, I don't know whether in China you have such uh, examples uh, with the teachers, uh, but this is one which was given by Richard Foley in his book, uh, Working Without a Net, uh, published in, in, in 93, in the last, of the last century. This is this example. Students learn from their teacher that they are going to have a difficult exam. And they also know that the, if they have confidence in their success, they will be more likely to pass. In other words, when you pass an exam, if you are confident that you will succeed, it's much better. Now, this is uh, the, if it, the tricky detail. The teachers also want to teach them humility. And they inform the students that they have, if, they, if they have too much self-confidence, they will receive, the students, they will receive a bad grade. How do they do that? Because they have a, a, a certain technical machine which allows the teacher to look into the brains of the students. And so if they see in their machine, in their cerebroscope, that the students are very confident in their success, what the teachers do is uh, give a bad grade. So on the one hand, the students want to have to succeed and they need to be confident. On the other hand, if they are confident, then the teachers will give them a bad grade. So in such cases, uh, what do you do? And what I'm saying, uh, and, and what uh, uh, Richard Foley says, is that in such cases, what happens is that the, uh, the, 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 ne the neopragmatists say that uh, you have to follow uh, your practical reasons. Uh, you, have to, uh, you, you have to obey uh, the call uh, of, uh, of, of, of practical reason. And this is certainly, uh, a, this is certainly uh, something which may be done, but the main presupposition of the neopragmatists is that there is a commensurability. You can compare your practical and uh, your epistemic reasons, and depending on the situation, you can make yourself the instrument of, uh, of your uh, of your aim. So, for instance, if you want to be uh, cured from a disease, you have better try to believe, depending only on your practical reasons and not on the epistemic one. And the students, what they have to do in, of course, the situation with the cerebral scope is difficult for them. But they, what they want is win uh, to win the exam. To, 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 to succeed. And so if the practical reasons turn out to be uh, better compared to the epistemic ones, they have to disregard uh, the epistemic one. So I'm not going to uh, discuss all the issues which uh, are around this, and I will uh, first go to the first argument by given by the neopragmatist, which is uh, not on the uh, comparability and incomparability, it, it's, uh, it, it's the one which I've just discussed. So I'm not going to go over uh, this slide. Uh, the, the first thing that the neopragmatists say is that the distinction between a right and a wrong kind of reason uh, is a spurious one. Uh, it's a distinction which uh, we should uh, withdraw. What is the distinction? It is also, again, a b better approach through example. Suppose that you encounter a demon. The demon, suppose it's a, it's a Chinese dragon. Uh, it, suppose this, this Chinese dragon is absolutely ugly. Uh, and uh, he, 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 he threatens you to, um, to kill you if you do not admire him. Uh, so what you have to do in such a case is to admire him because otherwise you will be dead. Uh, so in this case, the right reason is to believe that uh, or to admire the demon, but the wrong reason is to accept the threat and uh, to try to admire him. But of course, this is a wrong kind of reason in the sense that actually 
when you believe that someone is not admirable, you don't admire him, and you have to force yourself into admiring him in order to obey the other sort of reason. Now, many philosophers have made a distinction which is useful in this case between the state and the, the, the state and the content given reason. Some reasons are determined by the kind of state or the kind of attitude in which you want to be and the content of the reason. In the case of the demon, if the content is the demon is a beautiful animal, then this is the right kind of reason. You should not believe this. But the state, the attitude that you should have is that the demon is a, um, a beautiful animal and you ought to believe this because it is practically useful. So this is a distinction which is used in the literature. There is a huge kind, a huge literature on that. And according to uh, the uh, to the evidentialist, this is absurd because you have there is believing that the, that the demon uh, is a nice animal or, or that he is beautiful is not even a reason to believe because the reason to believe is epistemic. So maybe you can uh, sort of uh, desire to believe that the animal uh, is um, is beautiful because you are threatened, but this is not uh, the right the right kind of reason. So uh, some pragmatists actually deny this distinction, and they believe that uh, there are uh, cases where the state or the attitude given re the attitude given reason can equal uh, or override uh, the, uh, the, the epistemic reason. Why is it so? Because, in general, uh, they argue, uh, they, they accept uh, important differences or important criteria of differentiation between the right and the wrong uh, kind of reason. In particular, think again about the example of the, uh, the demon, the epistemic reasons are phenomenologically more direct and, as, and accessible, more transparent, whereas practical reason seems false. I mean, it's easier for you to believe that the dragon or the demon is ugly than believing that it is cute and beautiful. That's, uh, there's no contest about that. Second, epistemic reasons seem more rational than practical reason. That is, you can make more inferences uh, and it is more rational to, to, to use the epistemic reasons in order to make a reasoning than to take the practical reason. For instance, that means that if you have to engage in a reasoning about what to do next, uh, if, you, you, if you take the practical reasons as premises, you will have uh, a strange kind of, of reason. And also, they seem to be more correct and more appropriate to uh, believe uh, the epistemic reason than the practical reason. Uh, this is a terminology which has been very much discussed, and actually uh, David Fascio has a lot of discussions about this issue. It seems that epistemic reason are the right kind of reasons because they are correct, because it is correct to believe the truth, it is correct to believe the evidence, uh, whereas the practical reasons are different. But according to people like uh, Mark Schroeder, uh, a philosopher from California, uh, it seem, it, this disti distinction seems uh, not so, so clear. Uh, and he gives examples such as uh, when you have to suspend a decision. Suppose, for instance, that uh, you need to, uh, and, and that, that works better for, for an intention, but that, that could work also uh, for, for a belief. But suppose that we are dealing not with belief in this case, but with intention. Suppose that you intend to go to a certain town, uh, say Ubai, uh, but you have to defer uh, your visit. Uh, in such a case, it is quite all right to suspend your intention in, in, because you have to wait for more information. Uh, you don't know, for instance, whether the weather uh, will allow you to travel 
or whether the sanitary situation will be enough, and so on and so forth. So in the cases where uh, we have uh, to suspend a decision or suspend a belief, uh, it, seems, it seems that we can decide to have a certain kind of attitude and not simply follow the, the epistemic reason. There are practical reasons which enter in the picture. I don't think that this argument is very good uh, because uh, it is actually uh, it is actually not true that in such a case you have rejected the epistemic reasons uh, and the practical reasons have a, a bit uh, more weight uh, than the epistemic ones because you are still in the business of uh, uh, of taking uh, of. of uh, of defending a certain view. In the case of belief, if you suspend judgment, there can be good practical reasons to suspend judgment, but the judgment is always going to be determined by the epistemic reasons. Uh, think, for instance, on, of the cases where you have to swear in front of a dictator that the dictator is, uh, is a nice person. You can suspend your judgment for practical reason, because, for instance, suppose if you say that the dictator is uh, is not a good man, uh, you will be uh, jailed, for instance. Uh, but of course, uh, that doesn't mean that the epistemic reasons have disappeared. So it seems to me that this kind of familiar argument, which the neo pragmatists use, uh, according to which all reasons uh, are, are are practical uh, reasons and are, and they are. There is no, no wrong kind of reason uh, doesn't work. Now, let me just now deal with uh, the so-called comparability uh, of practical and epistemic reasons. Uh, I have given an example where you have to... Um, the, 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 the idea is, is, is the following. I mean, uh, to compare the epistemic and the practical reason, it seems to me, is pretty much the same uh, as uh, the as 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 the idea uh, that you could compare on the same uh, on the same scale uh, on the same balance uh, different fruits. Of course, the, you can compare apples and oranges uh, when they have the same weight, and of course, the balance can be uh, can, can be can give the same weight. Uh, to oranges and beers. But oranges and, and apples are not the same fruit. So uh, how can you put the two kinds of fruits in the same balance? And especially, how can you combine them? I mean, how can you combine eating apples and eating oranges? Eating apples is one thing, maybe the apples are more tasty, uh, and uh, tasty, eating oranges is another thing, maybe the, uh, the orange is too, uh, has too much uh, acidity. So, in the scenario, which is the classical or the, the canonical scenario of the, uh, the neo-pragmatist, uh, you, for instance, the example, uh, of the illness, which I'm going to repeat. Imagine someone suffering from a life-threatening illness who has been told that his chances of recovery are low if considered independently and are significantly higher if he believes he will survive. For instance, suppose that there are 20% chances that he will survive if he believes that uh, he, he, he will survive, that he has confidence, uh, than, if he, than if he doesn't believe. This in itself doesn't provide evidence uh, that would show that it will survive, but that seems a good reason to believe that the person uh, will survive. So it's quite clear that the person in this scenario wants to believe that he will survive and that he will want to cause himself to believe it. But it seems to me that it is uh, an, an argument by equivocation, and then there is an ambiguity. It is an equivocation to maintain that the person will have the designated belief in virtue of the data initially available to her. The fact that this data will change if he acts on a doxastic system uh, do, uh, doesn't show 
that she has answered, she has answered uh, the evidence. She only has very strong practical believing re reasons for believing, informed by data, on the instrumental effects of her action. And there is nothing here, in my view, that differs from what is usually called an action performed on the, on the basis of a certain information. They have a, the, 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 the neopragmatist has also another presupposition. Uh, it is the idea that you can compare the two types of reasons. All these examples show is that there is an interaction between the two types of reason. That is not to be denied, leading to decisions to believe and perhaps to believe. But these examples do not show that the agent compares their, these reason by placing them on a common scale. When we suspend judgment because the reasons for believing one thing or another are balanced, this means that we have data in favor of one or the other, or that we are, for instance, evaluating probability. And that these data balance each other out, or seem to weigh as much in one direction or another. Uh, but the fact that we can compare uh, weighing the pros and cons, uh, for instance, when we compare the, the practical reasons, is it a case of, uh, com of comparing epistemic with non-epistemic reason? For instance, suppose that uh, you want to take some holidays and you hesitate between spending your holidays uh, in Zangyaji, I hope that I pronounce correctly, uh, or in Guilin. Suppose that you have two destinations. Uh, we compare these th th reasons. I mean, for instance, one place is more beautiful than the other, or maybe one place is closer to where you are uh, than the others. Uh, that is perf it make perfectly good sense. Uh, but uh, these are reasons to act. These are not uh, reasons, epistemic and uh, practical reasons, uh, which have been compared. So uh, I, I think that there is uh, an, an equivocation here, and the, the pragmatist is sort of cheating when they say that we can put uh, on the same on the same scale uh, the two the two kinds of reason. Uh, another argument which uh, I I think is quite important uh, is that uh, there is a structural difference between the two kinds of reasons, practical and epistemic, which is that practical reasons are permissive, whereas epistemic reasons are not. Practical reasons are permissive in the sense that the agent is allowed to evaluate option A or option B as better, or to judge them equal, whereas epistemic reasons are prohibitive in the sense that it's not permissible, if you believe something, to believe the opposite. And if there are reasons to believe, to change these reasons, uh, so to, to, to change these reasons. And so uh, these are diff different sorts of reasons. Uh, now, suppose that you can make uh, the, can, can do the, the comparison. Um, suppose that you can do the comparison, and here I will use, uh, well, you, the idea that you can, you can uh, do the comparison has been, for instance, defended by uh, uh, Andrew Reisner in a paper in 2008. And he says he has just the same idea of comparability or balancing the two kinds of reasons. When the practical reasons are strong enough, the epistemic reasons are silent. And in other cases, the practical reasons are silent in determining what to believe. All the, all the things being equal. This is quite interesting uh, expression, the, the idea that the reasons are silent. What, it, what the pragmatist here wants to say is that there are cases where you sort of silence, you do not listen to the epistemic reasons, you listen only to the practical ones. Uh, but uh, there is an argument against this, which I borrow, uh, to, um, I borrow to, to, to the philosopher 
Selim, uh, Selim Berker. Uh, suppose, suppose the following thing. Um, suppose that, that the, you have three options. I should have actually done a, a, a slide on that. Suppose that uh, you have three options. You can either believe a certain proposition disbelieve it, that is not believe it, and you can suspend judgment. And suppose that the proposition in question is a question, the proposition that the number of books in your library is odd. So you can either believe that the number is odd, disbelieve it, not believe that it is odd, and you can say, don't know, suspend judgment. And suppose that there are strong practical reasons not to believe that the number of books in your library is odd. For instance, suppose that you offer me $10,000 not to believe it. And also suppose that you have equal practical reasons to suspend your judgment. So there is practically the same output for disbelieving and suspending. They give you $10,000. Now, suppose that these practical reasons receiving $10,000 are sufficient to silence or to ignore the epistemic reasons for believing uh, the proposition that my, the number of books in my library is odd. But if uh, it is true that when you act, you can be indifferent between one outcome and another, for instance, it is, it is one feature of practical reasoning that you are, if you are indifferent between going to one place and going to another place, for instance, if uh, going to Guilin and uh, going uh, to the other place, the other, the, the other uh, destination is indifferent. I mean, you, you get as much pleasure uh, going uh, from the one uh, to the other if, if, this is, if this is the case, then you should be uh, indifferent between the two options, because both are permissible. They have practically the same output. It follows that it is permissible both to disbelieve that the number of books is, is, is odd, that the number of books in my library is odd, and to suspend judgment. But suppose also that your epistemic reasons for not believing that the number of books is odd uh, as much as suspending your judgment on this proposition uh, is the same, that you have as much data in, fa in favor of one hypothesis as the other. And so it's, it follows that you should not be allowed to believe the proposition in this case. So contrary to the hypothesis given by Reisner, the epistemic reasons, even when you suspend them, uh, are still operative. So this contradicts the assumption that you can have a choice between believing that uh, the, 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 book, the number of books in your library is odd and suspending judgment about, about this. So uh, it is impossible in this case to combine uh, to com the, 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 the two kinds of reason. Now, uh, I'm going to uh, give my, my last points, but um, so, what happens, uh, it seems to me, with this discussion is this. Um, the pragmatist uh, is, um, is someone who actually con makes a confusion. He, makes, he, he, he has the view that, uh, sorry, that this is the one which is on my previous slides, number 17, the, this, this argument that we can compare the two kinds of reason, it assumes that practical reasons and epistemic reasons are comparable in the sense that it accepts the, the, what I call the teleological conception of rationality. The teleological conception of rationality says that if you value more a certain output than, a, than another output or result of your deliberation, then you should follow the one uh, which you value more. 
So the rationality is a rationality here of values. It's not a rationality uh, which uh, is derived from uh, the norms of belief. And it seems to me that the neo-pragmatists uh, are, um, are, are making here a confusion because they believe that uh, we can uh, evaluate the rationality uh, in terms of uh, the, 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 the output. Uh, and actually, it is something which some pragmatists accept, especially those two writers that I quoted above. Uh, they say uh, they say that uh, my guy and Woods, they they say that you 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 don't have to to, to look uh, at uh, the norms for belief. You don't have to look at what you ought to believe in terms of what it is correct to believe, because these are just rules of the game. Uh, the rules do not determine uh, what you are going uh, to, uh, to play or not. See, for instance, of chess. The rules of chess tell you what you ought to do and what you ought not to do uh, in a certain situation and in general. But they do not tell you which move you have to take. So, according to Maguire and, and Woods, uh, the only reasons which have authority are actually practical reasons. Because the, the important thing is what to believe in a certain circumstance, what to play. Uh, and so, uh, according to them, uh, we have also practical reasons for having uh, correct beliefs. So, for them, everything is a matter uh, of uh, practical reasons. My problem is this. Uh, if you say this, then uh, you accept that the evidence is still in play, uh, the, that the, the evidence is uh, the, the main reason uh, for, for a belief. What they say is, Maguire and Woods, that they defend what they call weak pragmatism. There are epistemic reasons, there are practical reasons, and epistemic reasons are grounded in the norm of correction of belief, which are truth and evidence. And in this sense, the thesis of the neo-pragmatist is not different from that, that of the evidentialist, even of the strong sort. Because what they argue is that actually there are reasons to believe practically, and there are reasons to believe epistemically. But they do not say that the epistemic reasons uh, are overridden by the, the practical one. Uh, they, they conclude uh, fallaciously that the only reasons that which have authority are practical reason. They do not argue that we believe regardless of epistemic reason or evidence, but that we have practical reasons for having correct beliefs. I think this is a trick. Uh, we don't have practical reasons for having correct beliefs. We have re we have correct beliefs, and these correct beliefs determine the reasons that we have, but they do not determine any kind of practical reason. So, on my view, what happens with the pragmatists when he accepts the idea that there are two kinds of reasons, it is, is that it trivializes the, the, the debate. Uh, the debate, it, it, there is nothing on which you can oppose if you are an evidentialist. To, the, to, to this sort of view. Uh, so uh, the reasons are governed by evidence uh, anyway. But, and this is my last point, you have people like Susanna Reinhardt who defends uh, an, a, a robust, a strong form of pragmatism. She says that, uh, she, she subscribes to what I've called the teleological conception of rationality, it is the view that rationality is determined by the kind of goal that you have. This is a view which has been defended, as I said, by Richard Foley. Richard Foley says that you have, you are rational if you pursue whatever objective or whatever goal or end that uh, you have given to yourself. For instance, if you want to be happy, everything which contributes to your happiness is rational. Uh, so even if 
uh, you you can destroy the world. You, you have to destroy the world, the whole world, in order to be happy. That will be rational. Uh, by joking, some of his colleagues have called this folly rationality, which means that this is a very bizarre kind of rationality. So, according to this view, uh, the questions. Uh, what is rational to believe, what is rational to do, must be treated in the same way and in the same sense as long as the overall utility of the agent is maximized. And this is a view which is defended by Susanna Renard. She calls this equal treatment, E-T. And uh, as those of you who have, are familiar with the philosopher David Hume, we recognize something which is very much congenial uh, to David Hume's view of reason. Uh, it is not, says Hume, contrary to reason to prefer uh, the destruction of the whole world to the scratching of my finger. And uh, Reynard seems to be a disciple of David Hume uh, in, in this sense. And she gives again the same sort of example than the one uh, that I have uh, given above. Uh, and uh, she gives, I'm not going to repeat uh, all these examples, I just give uh, two of them, C and E. The teacher may believe on the basis of good epistemic reasons that one of the pupils whom she has identified broke the window but in order not to humiliate him in front of the class, she pretends not to know who is the culprit. She even promises herself to forget him. So this is a practical reason to express the belief that the child has not broken the window. Third example, example E. When we get married, we promise fidelity. And promising implies believing what we will do, what we promise, when we promise, promise. But we also know that many marriages end in divorce. We therefore have good reasons to believe that we will do what we have very strong reason to believe what we will not do. So these are cases where there are, there is a conflict between the utility and the conflict, according to Reynald, uh, is uh, it sh shows that you have uh, you 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 have to um, you, you you have to only only to follow the practical reasons. I'm not going to go into uh, her other examples, uh, but I think that uh, she makes uh, she makes a mistake, which is once again uh, uh, a mistake of uh, equivocation. It seems to me that she agrees that all the sort of reasons that we have for believing uh, are uh, practical reason, but this is, this is wrong. I mean, she, she is right to say that we can have practical reasons to believe something. These are the reasons which I call the reasons uh, to want to believe. But it seems to me that she misunderstood, misunderstood the, uh, the idea that there is an exclusivity of epistemic reason. Uh, th th this view doesn't say that we must consider epistemic reason at the exclusion of all practical reason, but that epistemic reasons have a privilege. Uh, you know, it, to, to use Reisner's view, uh, uh, phrase, uh, we cannot uh, actually really silence uh, those. Um, actually, Rinald is uh, obliged to admit that it's not possible to disregard evidential consideration uh, in favor of Billy. She, she admits this is simply the case because most of the time these considerations uh, are taken into account because they are useful to the agent. But this privilege of epistemic consideration, she says, is purely contingent. Uh, and she says that this is the, the robustness, you know, pragmatist. Uh, and so uh, that means that epistemic reasons are never reasons to believe. In other, in other words, she, believe, she says that evidence is only 
one contingent way of believing. Most of the time, we believe uh, for, uh, uh, practical, for practical reason. But I don't agree. I mean, it seems to me that it is just impossible to silence uh, the, the epistemic reasons in this way. I'm not going to deal with our example. So I want to conclude and make a, a, a last note uh, to discuss something which has been uh, defended by Jie Gao uh, uh, to finish. So my conclusion is that the neo-pragmatist misunderstands uh, the thesis of uh, uh, exclusivity of, uh, of epistemic reasons. Uh, she, uh, she or he uh, says, rejects what she calls the neo-essentialist conception of beliefs. Uh, it is a purely contingent fact that uh, we have epistemic reasons. And all these authors seem convinced that the case in which you believe independently of the data or the evidence uh, are cases of belief. But these are not cases of beliefs. These are cases of decisions. So I conclude, I have considered some of the arguments of the neo pragmatists and in particular, I have not discussed their objections uh, to one principle which I mentioned very quickly, the principle of transparency for belief. But I did not, and I did not manage to find in the neo pragmatist thesis any convincing argument. Either of these theses amount to conceding evidentialism, in which case they are trivial, or, el or else they completely lack plausibility. It is possible that we are in a case which happens frequently in philosophy where two parties understand the notion in question so differently that there can be no real discussion between them. Pragmatists have a certain notion of reason to believe as considerations that serves, that serve the end or the purposes of agents. That is, they take only the teleological view of reason. My problem is I don't know what a reason if it is if it's, if it's just a teleological reason. Now, very last point. Uh, Jie Gao, in a very uh, interesting article recently, uh, has discussed what she called creedal pragmatism. This is a view according to which pragmatic or practical factors pertaining to the interest of agents are relevant to their beliefs. And there are actually two views that she discusses uh, on that score. One she calls threshold cradle pragmatism, according to which the sensitivity of belief uh, to relevant, there is a word which is missing here, to relevant practical factors is due to a corresponding sensitivity of the threshold or the degree of credence necessary for outright belief. The point is this, when in a certain situation, there is a strong weight of practical uh, reasons to, 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 to believe something, this, in some sense, threatens uh, your, uh, your, 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 your degree of belief. You tend to believe less that something, for instance, is the case, if there is something which is practically as at case. This has been called in the literature pragmatic encroachment. But J. Gao also discusses another view, which in many ways is stronger, uh, which he calls creedal pragmatism proper, according to which practical factors affect credence rather than the threshold of on, on credence. And she gives important empirical arguments to the effect that uh, the practical factors accept credence. I quite recognize uh, these cases and uh, the debate about pragmatic encroachment or creedal pragmatism uh, has been uh, very much discussed, but it seems to me that this debate uh, is not the same as the one which I have discussed today, and it seems to me that it does not affect uh, the views of the neo pragmatists In other words, if you are a creedal pragmatist, you are not bound to be a neo pragmatist The kind of evidentialism uh, to which I subscribe is perfectly compatible with the thesis of creedal pragmatism, that there is an influence, uh, sometimes even a very strong influence, of practical factors on the gathering, on the maintaining, 
or in the revising of evidence leading to a belief. An evidentialist can grant that this evidence can be strong or uh, that uh, it can be weak, but the evidentialist does not have to disagree with the results. But uh, it, uh, the, the, uh, it, 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 the, the credo pragmatist has to accept, it seems to me, that pragmatic factors uh, can, can be, can, can overweight or, or uh, override the, 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 the epistemic one. But it, it doesn't, in, in the view which is discussed by Chie Gao, uh, it, they are not ignored. They are not ignored, and, and that doesn't entail, it seems to me, the comparability between the, the, the evidential reasons and the practical reasons. So, uh, I hope that I have not been too long, uh, and uh, I'm going uh, to, stop, uh, to stop here. Uh, and, um, <coughs> Thank you very much, Professor I Pascal. So, uh, uh, I, leave, I leave my commentator uh, to the, the floor. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks for your informative and uh, stimulating lecture. I got a lot from your lecture. Uh, we have enough time to discuss uh, more than 30. We run this way. And first, uh, Professor David Fossil gave his comments and questions. Then, Professor Pascal Enger gave his replies. Then, Professor Gao Jie gave his give her comments and uh, questions. Then, Professor Pasha Anger uh, gave your replies. Okay? Uh, if uh, still have some time, then we choose one or two questions from the audience. Okay? okay. Uh, first, yes. <coughs> Okay, so thank you. Uh, the most, uh, thanks a lot for this uh, presentation. Thanks, Pascal, for this uh, very interesting talk. And I, I had also the pleasure of reading the, the full article, which is uh, uh, even richer and uh, uh, it's a very helpful reading on this topic. Uh, so in the chat, I share some comments uh, that I, I put together when I prepared this uh, uh, response. I tried maybe to share the screen so you can see. Um, uh, or maybe I cannot, uh, maybe I can, okay, I can share the, the desktop after. That's, uh, let me see if I can. No, I can. Okay. You, you, you have, you have your comments on the, on, on the PDF. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you, I, I already uploaded in the chat, so, um, but actually I cannot, uh, um, share anything, but anyway, it doesn't matter. You can, uh, you can uh, read the comments uh, if you, if you uh, open the, the file. So, um, I, first of all, I would like, uh, so I would like to say, like, this is a really helpful uh, talk and helpful paper for me, even if it's many years that I've been working on those topics. It's, uh, it's been really, uh, um, really helpful uh, to, uh, to uh, update on, on this topic and, uh, and no more. Uh, so in this paper, uh, Pascal provides a critical assessment uh, of uh, uh, neo-pragmatist views. And uh, uh, in particular, he discusses uh, uh, two types of, of contemporary neo-pragmatism, weak pragmatism, which is a view that there are epistemic reasons to believe, uh, but there are also uh, pra e e e epistemic re uh, practical reasons to believe, and the practical reasons are as good as the epistemic at least sometimes. So uh, sometimes we have both type of reasons and we can balance uh, one against the other. So this is the type of pragmatic encroachment that has been discussed by philosophers such as uh, first uh, Schroeder, but uh, recently like uh, also uh, Reisner or uh, Howard. And then uh, the other form of, of uh, pragmatism is robust pragmatism, which is the view that uh, all epistemic reasons are practical reasons fundamentally, or there are no epistemic reasons, or that epistemic reasons don't have any normative force. So, so you can put it in different ways, but the idea is always that uh, uh, all the game uh, is uh, all the normative game is played by practical reasons, and, uh, and so these views are typically contrasted with evidentialism, which is the view that uh, uh, either there are only epistemic reasons to believe, 
or the right epistemic reasons have an exclusive priority over practical reasons, and uh, um, practical reasons are not uh, authoritative as epistemic reasons. So this is uh, so one thing that I found really helpful, both in the paper and in the talk, uh, is the way in which uh, Pascal introduced this topic. He provided a very rich and well-informed discussion, not just of this debate, uh, but of a series of topics that uh, relate to it. Uh, so he connected the debate uh, on, on pragmatism to, for example, the debate on wrong kind of reason, uh, constitutivism, backpassing, a fitting attitude, a council reasons, uh, uh, but also uh, with the logical conception of epistemic normativity, uh, the talks of the involuntarism, and many other uh, uh, important topics in contemporary epistemology. And the nice things that he does in this paper, especially at, at, in, also in the talk, I think, but in the paper is clearly visible, is to show uh, the connection between uh, uh, pragmatism and certain specific views, such as the rejection of the voluntarism, teleological and instrumental perspectives, and uh, on the other hand, certain commitments or uh, um, ideas that fit really well with uh, uh, the evidentialists, such as constitutivism, uh, mark passing, uh, and I think that in, con in some contemporary debate, some discussion of pragmatists, uh, some of those connections are often uh, uh, underestimated or uh, not uh, properly discussed, especially on like uh, the, the connection, for example, between uh, uh, evidentialism and constitutivism. So it seems like when those philosophers discuss pragmatism, they tend not to discuss anymore uh, the important uh, uh, correlation that there is between constitutivism and evidential. In fact, they just ignore constitutivism. They, they put aside this, this discussion. So the nice thing of this paper is that uh, it brings uh, uh, together um, all those debates that are all relevant for the, for the, the debate between pragmatism and evidentialism. And, uh, uh, and like really, Pascal's always spun back 20, 30, 40, 50 years, like you can really take together all the, the important information that has been developed, not just in the last 10 years, but uh, uh, in, uh, in the case. Uh, so I have uh, um, so some critical comment. One was about uh, um, the argument, uh, Angel argument, the Pascal argument uh, uh, against the Schroeder, uh, the, the, the form of Schroeder of uh, uh, weak pragmatism. So, the idea of Schroeder is that uh, um, it's true that maybe there are only evidential epistemic reasons to believe or to disbelieve. Uh, they are all uh, content or objective and reasons, but there are also uh, practical reasons for the caustic attitude, and these are reasons for withholding or suspending judgment. And these are can be all state based uh, uh, reasons. And uh, as uh, Pascal uh, discussed also today and uh, uh, discussed in the paper, the idea is that. Uh, um, there is the, the year of Schroeder is that uh, those reasons affect whether we are uh, entitled to suspend judgment or uh, to uh, uh, form a belief in a situation. For example, high stakes uh, uh, in a situation of or urgency can affect whether uh, whether uh, a subject should suspend judgment rather than belief. Right? And so Schroeder take these to be genuine epistemic reasons and uh, the genuine reasons to <laughs> practical reasons to believe. Right? The genuine practical reasons to believe. And uh, the, the, the response of Pascal that I think is uh, um, quite uh, important and uh, on the right uh, direction is to say that uh, even when we suspend judgment, even when we have to decide between suspending judgment and believing, we pay attention to data. It's not as if we were just uh, uh, blankly choosing two options, two alternatives that are equally good for us. Right? Uh, we, we are uh, always balancing data and evidence. Uh, in every type of situation which we assess whether uh, we should be like suspend judgment. And of course, sometimes then uh, we also uh, factor in this uh, uh, um, weight of epistemic reasons, also practical factors, just urgency and the uh, and, um, uh, stakes, for example. Um, but uh, so this is the point uh, of uh, Pascal, but I think that. Um, the, the like Schroeder or the parliament could just answer by saying, like, of course, there are epistemic reasons uh, involved in every uh, uh, judgment or whether to suspend or believe, uh, but there are also practical reasons. So the point is, uh, uh, those practical factors are still practical reasons and they have authority, right? So, and they are genuine epistemic reasons, the genuine practical reasons, they are the good type of good kind of reasons for believing. And so, this is how maybe Schroeder could uh, try to respond. And in order to counter this response, uh, should, we should try to say that um, those practical factors are not genuine reasons, right? So they are um, modifiers of the threshold, 
for of evidence necessary for uh, believing rather than suspending, but they are not uh, good type of reason. They are they are not normative force, right? So, so the, the real issue there, it seems to me, between uh, uh, taking those consideration, uh, particular consideration as a uh, reason, and then uh, uh, in that moment, you have a pragmatist because these are good reasons. They can uh, uh, determine what you should believe, right? Or they are just practical factors which affect the the the, the epistemic, epistemic consideration, but are not reason. There you are in pragmatic encroachment. You have a view that says that like the one of Phantom or or and uh, and so that is a uh, uh, so I think the argument of Pascal is uh, is good, but I think it's, it's incomplete because it should also address this and uh, um, this issue of uh, arguing that those practical factors are not good reason. Right? So, so there is one practical reason for believing, and this is a good reason, and you're already a pragmatist. <laughs> uh, so that is a is a, a small point. So then the, another point I would like to make is about comparability, and here it's not really a, a criticism. But actually, it's, I, I really enjoy a lot that part of the paper, and it's the part that uh, I, I like most. And uh, um, in particular, what I really like is uh, uh, the way in which, uh, so the, the point of comparability is uh, similar to the point of incommensurability. So there is this standard view where the epistemic and practical reason are not commensurable because they are like two different types of things. Right? But this point is not, not often made uh, in, a, in a clear cut way, in a very precise way. And I think that Pascal pointed to, to this issue by uh, really Putting the finger where the problem is. Uh, the problem is uh, in, uh, in the type uh, uh, of, uh, of scale used to measure the shipping. So there is, there is a, not a commensurable type of scale on which we measure the two uh, type of reasons. And so, and the way in which you see like the importance of this point is when Pascal mentioned uh, uh, the relation between uh, how we, on the one hand, how we measure epistemic reasons on a probability scale. And how we measure practical is on utility scales. And these are completely different type of scales. Probabilities are measured on a ratio scale, they are additive, they are type of fitting, and utilities are, are not very likely to be on non-ratio scale or an interval scale. They they are uh, only semi-additive, they are additive at all. So they are really measured in different ways. So it's not just a matter that they seem to be different and uh, intuitively we use them as different things. We can find a, a meter on which we can uh, measure the two and compare them. Right? So, so when when you don't have a way to measure and compare them, how can uh, you say that uh, uh, what you should do is the result of a comparison? The, the two things are just incomparable. Right? And so that is, a, I think, is a really um, uh, well made point. Uh, but I would like to to say that there there are some philosophers that here could uh, uh, could address this problem. I, I don't agree with those philosophers, but. There is some philosopher, such as, um, for example, Kearns and Starr, uh, or uh, uh, Nair has recently argued, it's the thing that the practical reasons are uh, just evidence uh, that we should do certain things. So a practical reason to um, go to the cinema tonight is just the evidence that you should go to the cinema tonight. Right? And they think of this evidence as a probability. So like the practical reason you have to go to the cinema is the probability given your evidence that you should go to the cinema, right? So if those philosophers are right, then we can say that uh, um, both epistemic and practical reason can be measured on the same scale, right? And so they can uh, can uh, avoid this issue. Now, I think that these views are, are really not promising at all for some reason discussed also by Pascal. For example, how can you have a decision theory if you have uh, uh, utilities that are reducible to probabilities? Uh, so you really need to, live, like, all human psychology sort of crumbles when you take desires uh, as beliefs. And so, so for, for many reasons, I don't think that this is a promise, uh, promising way to go. Uh, still, a pragmatist could, could address the, the, the problem of uh, um, um, measuring uh, practical reason and epistemic reason on the same scale by taking those uh, approaches. Um, so this is not really an objection. Actually, I think that all those views are not uh, promising, but uh, uh, this is one way to do it. And, uh, and then I would like to say something about uh, uh, authority. Uh, like uh, when, when um, Pascal discusses the view of uh, Wood and Maguire, uh, and uh, so there, there is this, this um, objection of those philosophers that uh, they argue that epistemic reasons are not authoritative. They, they imply masks which are sort of functional masks. 
They are not, uh, uh, they don't imply duties or obligation, right? And so this is, it's, it's curious that uh, this point is presented as a sort of so original and uh, uh, introduced by Wooden Aguirre as like, a, so some, like the discover of water, of water, right? Because this point was already discussed by uh, Alan Azlet some year before, but many years ago, maybe don't, don't remember, but in 2005, for example, Gideon Rosen had a paper in response to uh, Ron Tiver, he just advanced the same point in a better way, I think. And also Pascal, Pascal Jean, the same, uh, same year, I think, uh, also discussed that, uh, that idea. So, so uh, and, and so, um, like the idea, so of those objections to, the, to uh, so those, those practical the defense of, of pragmatism are based on the idea that epistemic reasons exist, but they don't have uh, any authority. Right? And the response of Pascal is to, is to say, um, sort of, yeah, we can admit this point, but this is compatible with evidentialism, right? And there is where I think uh, I sort of disagree with, uh, with Pascal, because, uh, so, like in the paper, for example, Pascal say, oh, we don't need the epistemic norms that imply obligations, um, so that we don't need the type of authority, epistemic norms could imply ideals or values, uh, and uh, in that case, uh, still we have a... Uh, um, sort of normative force without authority, right? Uh, but the way in which uh, uh, those philosophers such as Wooden and Guarani really think uh, of the objection of authority is that uh, there is no authority whatsoever, no normative authority whatsoever in epistemic reasons and epistemic norms. So they treat those norms as rules of the game. And so we can just choose not to play, right? And so they, they think that uh, uh, those rules, those norm, epistemic norms don't have even the authority of an ideal or a value or any type of uh, normative uh, conception. So, so it's not just uh, that, uh, so don't think that the evidentialists could ever accept this idea because evidentially has to assume uh, some kind of authority of epistemic reasons in order to say that uh, epistemic reasons are exclusive or have exclusive priority over practical reasons. Right? And uh, so, yeah, maybe on this point, uh, Pascal can, uh, can add something and uh, worry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the last point on, on Rina's pragmatism, but I think that, uh, um, yes, uh, there's a small point about uh, the notion of motivating region, uh, Rina, so it's not really something I, can, uh, I, I would like to go over. Yeah, so I can conclude uh, here. And, uh, and thanks again, Pascal, for, uh, for this, uh, uh, this paper. I, I really appreciate it. Like, I, I discussed only points in which I, 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 I had some disagreement, but uh, on the most uh, but I, I, I was completely in, uh, in agreement with what you said. Thank you very much, Davide. Uh, we have discussed these issues for many years, uh, and you now you know much better the, the, the issues than me. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very happy that, that um, to have had to your remark. What should I do now, uh, Chen Bo? What, what do I do? Yeah. Do I do I reply to to David Day and then yes yes then, yes yes uh, uh, you so reply uh, and then uh, and then G G G G comes in. Uh, Gao Jie, if okay. uh, we too long time, you may be uh, forget something. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So I will be very quick to reply to to uh, to, to 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 David Day. Uh, first, about uh, the argument by uh, Mark Schroeder. Um, the argument by Schroeder is, is a bit tricky because he actually sort of um, emerges uh, issues about intention and issues about belief. Uh, what he says is that when I have to take a decision, uh, I, I, I have an intention. For instance, I have an intention to go to Wuhan uh, next week, uh, and I can also uh, differ my my decision. But uh, he, he says that uh, this I differ my decision to believe that I will go to Huan. But of course, uh, this decision to believe is is an action. Uh, so he, he makes a confusion between a belief and an action. And of course, if you make this, this confusion you have already uh, won. I mean, your argument is, if the argument of the pragmatist is to confuse decisions and belief, uh, he will win the, the, the topic. So I disagree. I disagree. His example is not an example of a belief. It's an example of a decision. Uh, 
And now, of course, decisions are practical things. I mean, they involve intentions. So the paper was uh, never convinced me. And of course, you are right. Uh, practical reasons uh, for uh, for the pragmatists, the neo-pragmatists, people like Schroeder, are good reasons. Well, uh, I, I I disagree. I mean, this is all connected to this idea that uh, you silence or you uh, you overlook the, the epistemic reason. There are certain situations where you have to silence you you. The epistemic reasons do not speak to you, but they are still there. They are operating, so to say, in in the wings. They are operating from behind. You cannot simply just... So it seems to me completely crazy to say that the practical reason could be the only reason. Uh, that would be That would be something like blind faith. Of course, in some religious... Uh, context. Maybe you have to take, you, you, you can have practical reason which would be faith. I mean, this is this is the, the, the argument by Pascal uh, uh, in the wages. Uh, you can disregard, you can go to faith. At this point, if there is someone who tells me this, I will, I, I have no objection, but we are not talking about the same thing. I mean, faith is not reason. I'm sorry. Uh, for 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 the uh, religious people who, who believe that there are reasons for faith, uh, in some sense, I mean, your faith can be your your faith can be backed or it can be supported by some sort of reasons. But if you say that the faith is the practical reason, and so even in the in in the ordinary cases, uh, I, I say, saying that. Only a practical reason can be good. But the pragmatist, the, 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 um, the evidentialist, doesn't have to deny that we have also practical reasons. Of course, there are many cases where our practical reason compete or uh, uh, screen, screen off uh, the, the epistemic reason. But that doesn't mean at all that the epistemic reason has disappeared. So uh, there is no disagreement here. Concerning the comparability, this is important. Yes, you are right to mention me to me the view by Kearns and and Starr, uh, where they, where they say that uh, to, uh, to, to 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 have a practical reason is to have evidence that you will do a certain thing. But all the whole problem is whether the evidence that you have to do a certain thing is the same thing as having a practical reason. Because I may have a, a lot of evidence that I, that, 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 that I ought to do something, but nevertheless not act. So they also have uh, this view, they also have an authority problem. I mean, how can the evidence itself be a, a, be a cause uh, or, a, or, a, or a motor uh, for, for, for doing something? So that, this is this is tricky, and of, I, I fully agree with you that if we were putting on the same scale uh, the the practical and the epistemic reasons, uh, it would be like the, the thesis which has been discussed by David Lewis uh, called desire as belief. If you mix up uh, the two kinds of scales, uh, you end up with incoherences, and actually many people will be able to make Dutch books against you, and so you will be in some sense uh, irrational. So here again, there are many, may, there may be some limiting cases where it might be true, uh, and I'm actually, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of a certain view of desire as, be, as belief, where, where believing that one ought uh, is uh, is is the important uh, in explanation of, of of a reason, and that I I am against the, the human view which say that you have always a desire here, but this is independent from the, the, the mixing of the scale. Third question: the authority. Yes, this is the main point. This is important, uh, and it's true that the constitutive uh, norms of belief. 
uh, all the rules of the game on chess, they do not by themselves uh, guide you and they do not uh, have authority. Uh, that's right. But uh, I think I, we, we, can have, we can have a story here um, that depends how, uh, how you consider a, a person who reasons, whether it's in, in the third person or in the first person. Uh, in the first person, it seems to me very difficult if you are aware of the correctness condition of a belief not to be uh, governed by the authority of that belief. Uh, it would be pretty much like uh, playing a game and forgetting forgetting the rules. Uh, so there, there is a point where you have to recognize the authority of the rules. The problem is that authority may be a, a, a matter of degree uh, it does not command, it does not prescribe in the way in which a practical norm prescribes. I mean, if I say you ought not to kill, uh, this is prohibitive. It's true that when I have, uh, I, I'm dealing with the authority on beliefs, uh, it's probably not uh, the same sort. So uh, I, I grant the point, but it doesn't, it doesn't show at all that Maguire and Woods, the, the two guys who use this argument, uh, are, are, are correct. I mean, in my view, either they, trivial, they trivialize the problem or they, they, they make the, the wrong move. So I, I stop here. Thanks. <laughs>